good afternoon and welcome to our webinar on the Local Early Action Planning Grants. My name is Melissa Keen. I'm with the Institute for Local Government and we are part of the technical assistance team for the LEAP grant. Um, to get us started this afternoon, I'm going to go ahead and introduce Michael Sagala with Sagala Incorporated to provide some welcoming remarks. Michael? Hi, thank you and good afternoon everyone. Uh, on behalf of the eight regional planning agencies or our COGS or MPOs, of the San Joaquin Valley. Uh, thank you for joining this important webinar. Um, we asked HCD and thank you HCD and all the other partners on the phone for helping out with this. We requested this webinar just because we didn't want to see monies not utilized in the valleys uh, for housing. So uh, last count we had there was 24 jurisdictions and approximately $3.6 million of uh, un unused money for this program. So uh, this uh, webinar is timely and it's important and it will help your cities grow uh, efficiently. So thank you so much. Um, I will now turn it uh, over to Robert Phipps, who's the Deputy Director of Fresno COG, and he has a few words to say as well. So thank you again. Yeah, thank you, Michael. <clears throat> yeah, my name is Robert Phipps. I'm Deputy Director with Fresno Council of Governments, and we're serving as the uh, fiscal agent for the Valleywide uh, Regional Early Action Planning Effort, also known as REAP. Uh, but uh, our relationship with uh, LEAP is uh, well ensconced in statute and, uh, you know, and, and in, in practice because we're very interested in making sure that uh, all, all of our local jurisdictions in the San Joaquin Valley are uh, accessing LEAP to the uh, degree that it's possible because certainly uh, the LEAP funds, even uh, with the smallest jurisdictions, uh, it, it, you know, whatever they're receiving in terms of uh, direct allocations from LEAP, uh, they certainly have the ability to match that uh, with additional allocations uh, from REAP, depending on the, the region you're in, uh, at least to leverage uh, the LEAP and REAP funds together uh, to help further housing production throughout the Valley uh, and the state. Uh, so we, we hope you enjoy the, the webinar, find it useful, and uh, that it uh, you know will spur you into action in terms of uh, applying for the uh, grant if you haven't already. The deadline uh, January 31st, and uh, you know uh, if you have already applied, uh, thank you for doing so, uh, and hopefully you'll learn uh, you know some of the eligible activities. Uh, you know if you're if you're looking for ways to uh, to use that money, haven't decided already. Um, on the REAP front, just as a quick update, um, <clears throat> we're, we'll be doing some valley-wide activities as well with some of the REAP funds uh, that may be of use to the local jurisdictions. And so I encourage you to uh, reach out to either myself, uh, uh, Mr. Sagala, or HCD, uh, if we can be of any assistance, uh, especially with regard to technical assistance or uh, with regard to uh, uh, data. Uh, that you may need to to complete your uh, local activities, um, and also that we will be applying for uh, the the last uh, half of the funds uh, along with uh, at, just as you're doing the leap money as well uh, in late January, another uh, 8.7 million dollars coming into the valley uh, that we believe will uh, most likely be suballocated in some way. Uh, to the jurisdictions as well. So there's there's still more money to come uh, from uh, on the REAP side. And of course, the deadline again for the, the LEAP funds, not until uh, January 31st. So there is still time. Uh, there's money out there. Uh, we hope you'll, you'll have uh, every opportunity to use it. And thank you. And uh, to kick things off, uh, I would like to introduce uh, Soheb Mehmood, a housing policy specialist with uh, HCD, who's going to guide you through the LEAP process. So thank you very much, it's Soheb. Great, thank you so much, Robert and Michael, for that introduction. Again, my name is Soheb Mehmood. I'm with the California Department of Housing and Community Development, also known as HCD. I lead the technical assistance program for the LEAP program, for the LEAP funding program. What that means is that we have an in-house TA program at HCD who's available to help you with all LEAP needs, including applying for the LEAP funding, general questions, reviewing your draft applications, anything you possibly need to help apply to apply for the LEAP program, we are here available at HCD to help you. I'm hoping this webinar and this presentation will be very informative for all of you and give you kind of the steps you need to apply for the LEAP um, program so that you have everything possible to get your application in as soon as possible. 
Next slide, please. So just a quick agenda overview. I'm gonna go over the program itself, the eligible applicants, the award amounts. Uh, I'll go into the eligible activities, including pro-housing policies. I'll try to kind of loop in some actual real life examples of what cities have applied for using LEAP and also SB2 funding. I'll go into the eligible uses, some key dates you wanna be aware of, the entire application process, and then the technical assistance and resources we have for this LEAP program, as well as REAP and SB2. Um, in addition to LEAP. Next slide, please. And I will hand it over to Melissa to go over logistics really quick. Yeah, so just a couple of housekeeping items before we jump into the, the bulk of the presentation. Um, you probably have noticed that your lines are all muted um, and we will stay that way for the duration of the webinar, um, but that doesn't mean you can't ask questions. So um, you should see a questions box in your control panel on the right-hand side of your screen. Um, feel free to type in any questions at any point during the webinar, um, and we will have time at the end to, to go through those and address um, the questions that come up. Um, another quick housekeeping item, just to note for all of you, we will be recording. Uh, we, well, we are recording this webinar, and we will distribute that recording along with the slide deck um, to all of you and everybody who registered um, following the webinar. So um, you will have access to the slides and can revisit any of this that um, is needed after the webinar as well. Great, thank you, Melissa. So um, now I'm gonna go into a quick overview of what is LEAP and where did it come from? Next slide, please. So to kind of go over what LEAP is and how we came to the LEAP program, we're gonna go over a um, quick history lesson on the last couple of years in the legislature and with HCD. So in 2017, many, many of you are hopefully familiar, we had the largest housing package um, in California history. It was the 2017 housing package that the legislature passed. And as a result of that housing package, hopefully many of you are also familiar, we got the SB2 planning grants funding source. And that was also our first permanent ongoing source of affordable housing. Um, as a follow-up with the housing package, the 2018 and 2019 SB2 planning grants, again, I really hope all of you are familiar and applied for that funding. Um, and the first, the first year of that funding source, again, went to develop the planning grants program, much like the LEAP program. As we implemented that SB2 planning grants program, we received applications from 491 cities and counties in California. That's almost 90% of the state. So that was a huge success for both the cities, the counties, the COGS, and the state. And applicants applied for a variety of activities. So this included rezoning land for buy right development or for higher densities, developing standards and programs that are encouraging ADUs, implementing process improvements such as permit tracking systems to reduce the time it takes to permit um, to process permitting applications and a lot of more activities. Uh, you can get an idea of all of those activities. And again, if you're still thinking about what you might wanna use your LEAP funding for, I'm happy to send an example of a lot of the activities applied for under SB2 to you so you can kind of spur up some ideas. And then in 2019 and 2020, we got a new governor who made housing um, a high priority for the, for the state. So that came with the 2019 and 2020 Budget Act, which was a combination of funding, incentives, and accountability measures for local governments. Of those funding programs that we're talking about today was the Early Action Planning Grants. Now the Early Action Planning Grants is an umbrella for both the LEAP and the REAP program. That includes $250 million to local and regional governments to accelerate housing planning and, apply for the, and plan for their six cycle arena. So as you can see, concurrently with a lot of these funding programs that have come out, including REAP and LEAP, you can see that the six cycle arena is, that cycle has begun. And for some regions and cities, it could increase significantly. And so to help a lot of cities, counties, regions, you know, again, apply, uh, plan for and accommodate their six cycle arena, it's been paired with funding sources like LEAP and REAP to, to help facilitate that process. So in addition, February 2020, early this year, we um, released the NOFAs for both the LEAP program as well as the REAP program. Um, and in summer 2020, that actually should be revised. We are also developing pro-housing regulations. Pro-housing program is basically a way cities and counties can get awarded for implementing policies that are pro-housing friendly. And we're currently right now though, in the process of working on that reg emergency regulations, as well as the application process. 
for a city or a county to apply to become a pro housing designated jurisdiction. We're hoping those regulations, again, I'm sorry, the slide is not updated. We're hoping those regulations will be available at the latest February of next year. Next slide, please. So really quickly, again, going, direct, um, going in detail to the 2019-2020 Budget Act, again, it included three main components, funding, incentives, and accountability measures for jurisdictions to plan for and accelerate housing production. So funding we're gonna talk about today, which is the LEAP and REAP, um, as the LEAP and REAP planning grants program. The incentives included the pro-housing program that will enable cities and counties to gain a designation for having land use and poli planning policies that are conducive for housing development to occur in their jurisdictions. And lastly, paired with these funding and incentives, all this fun stuff, also came accountability. And so what that means is, you know, for example, cities and counties can be fined for not complying with state housing element law. So gaining compliance for the six cycle arena is gonna be even more important this time around. Next slide, please. Thank you. And then I'll go into now the purpose of LEAP. So LEAP provides a one-time funding source in the form of planning grants to cities and counties that are non-competitive. So I'm gonna emphasize not competing with anyone. The funding is almost kind of waiting for you to prepare, adopt, and implement any planning documents or process improvements that can either accelerate housing production and or facilitate your compliance to help local governments implement their six cycle arena. So this is what I'm just trying to say is a very flexible funding source. It's non-competitive, it's one time, it's over the counter. All you gotta do is really have an eligible activity and fill out the application and get, we can help you get, get into the door and get your funding. Next slide, please. So who's eligible to apply? So eligible applicants are limited to local governments. That means cities and counties. There is room for a partnership between cities and counties with other local entities, um, as long as that proposal will have a direct effect on land use or development within the participating locality. So for example, a partnership can look like partnering with other cities, neighboring cities or counties, partnering with your regional government, partnering with housing authorities, school district, community-based organizations, or even tribes. Next slide, please. So here are the maximum ward amounts based on your population size. There is a um, document on the LEAP website on HCD's, on HCD's website on the LEAP webpage um, that gives you in detail what exactly your jurisdiction is eligible to apply for. Um, I won't go th over these in details, but again, you can also maybe just drop, if you are curious to know what you're eligible to apply for, you can drop your city name in the chat and one of our um, organizers can send you your maximum grant amount. Next slide, please. So let's go, let's do an overview now of the eligible activities. So the goal of the, your proposed po project should be to seek should be seeking to accelerate housing production and facilitate the compliance with implementing the six cycle arena. So what that means is basically whatever project you wanna identify, you wanna make sure it has a tie to housing planning, housing production, and or your six cycle arena. So all activities must demonstrate that it can have an increase in housing related planning activities and facilitate accelerated housing production. And also, an eligible activity can be part of a larger, larger planning effort, such as comprehensive zoning code update, if the proposed activity has not been completed prior to the NOFA for LEAP, is distinct and demonstrates a nexus to accelerating housing production. So really what that means is if you have projects going on right now that you would like to also um, put, in the, put in your LEAP application, as long as that project um, started after the date of the NOFA was released for the LEAP program and is ongoing, you can use some of that LEAP funding to apply for that, to fund that project. Next slide, please. So there's a really long list of eligible activities. Um, these slides do not include every single eligible activity. Also, the NOFA has a long list of eligible activities. That doesn't include a list of them, but here are just, I guess you could say, some ideas or generally some activities that we've seen with this program. 
So we've seen CEQA streamlining through completing environmental clearances that eliminate the need for any project-specific review, implementing local process improvements that speed up the approval process for housing. So sometimes that's software upgrades, um, developing and improving ADU ordinances, developing pre-approved architectural or site plans, uh, housing elements that include a implementation component to, to, to help facilitate compliance with the six cycle arena. Next slide, please. Encouraging development by rezoning um, through updating planning documents, ordinances, and uh, general plans, community plans, specific plans, implementation of sustainable community, plan community strategies or local coastal plans, rezoning efforts such as rezoning for multi more multifamily housing, rezoning to comply with housing element requirements and RENA, or rezoning to just increase housing capacity. Any upzoning efforts, zoning for buy right supportive housing, zoning incentives for special needs populations. Next slide, please. And as mentioned for the Pro Housing Program, um, eligible activities can also include pro housing policies, implementing pro housing policies. So pro housing policies facilitate the planning, approval, and construction of housing. So these policies are included, but they're not limited to, again, there's a long list of ideas and policies, but generally planning for local financial incentives, such as developing a local housing trust fund, reducing parking requirements for sites zoned for residential development, zoning that allows for buy right uses, for residential and or mixed use development, process improvements that reduce permit processing time, objective design and development standards. And again, like I said, there's a lot more activities and ideas that you can use the LEAP funding to apply. Next slide, please. So I've mentioned pro housing a couple times. I wanna take a quick break from the LEAP program to talk about pro housing, especially in case you are a jurisdiction who might have your eyes on the program and may be interested in getting a pro housing designation. Next slide, please. So the Pro Housing Program, again, was a result of the 2019-2020 Budget Act. And it was basically a way to reward local good actors for enacting land use policies and or regulatory local policies that are just basically housing friendly. And so HCD right now is developing an emergency regulations, which is gonna set forth the process, basically the application process, to where to how a city can gain this pro housing designation or label. But sometimes I think of it as a stamp where you know you've gotten a stamp that yes, city of or county of Madeira is pro housing friendly and we're welcome to development. The program will designate jurisdictions, so again cities and counties as pro housing when they've demonstrated policies and strategies that lead to accelerating housing production through the application process. So if you're a local government and you do receive that pro housing designation or that label or that stamp, you'll receive bonus points on several different competitive funding programs. So one example of being more of getting these bonus points and thus making you more competitive for other funding programs include AHSC, so that's known as the Affordable Housing and Sustainability Communities Program, TCC, which is also known as the Transformative Climate Communities Program and IIG, which is known as the Infill and Structure Grant Program. So what this basically means is once you get that label, you're gonna get, you'll be awarded more points on these three competitive funding programs. The department's also looking to partner with other departments throughout the state to inc incorporate pro-housing policies into their program guidelines. So pro-housing pro policies fall into a few key categories. These categories include favorable zoning, decreased timeframes to approve permits, reducing construction and development costs, and providing financial subsidies. Within these four categories, next slide, please. Within these four categories, here are kind of the ways that you can qualify for each of those categories. So allowing residential and mixed uses by right, that's also an eligible use for LEAP, if you're interested. Zoning more sites for residential or increasing densities, also for LEAP, do you get my trend here? Allowing for parking reductions, limiting number of public hearings to three or less, adopting ADU ordinances that reduce barriers to developing ADUs, creating objective design standards, establishing a local housing trust fund. Again, just examples of way of pro-housing policies. And if, again, if you're interested in applying to that program and you do want to implement pro-housing policies, uh, you can definitely use your LEAP funding to do so. Next slide, please. 
So what are some ineligible activities under the ELEAP program? So first, ineligible activities, any proposed activity that's unrelated to preparing and adopting a planning document that does not seek to accelerate housing production. Second, any project-specific planning document that does not have a significant impact on housing production or community level impact is not eligible. So what this means is if you're thinking about, hey, I have this site, it's two acres, I want to rezone it, it may yield to 30 units, That's a we consider that a project specific planning document. Those are typically ineligible unless one, it's gonna have a huge significant effect on your community or it's gonna have a reoccurring benefit. So what an example is of a project specific um, planning project that would be eligible would, you know, hey, I have this 25 acre site. I want to rezone it, design, um, adopt objective standards and do the CEQA. And this 25 acre site may lead to, you know, 300 units potentially in our community. And it's one fourth of our uh, arena, so it can make a huge impact on our community. That is kind of a project specific uh, planning document that may be eligible under the LEAP program, given that it's gonna have a huge effect on your community. Lastly, any activities that obstruct or hinder housing production. So what that means is moratoriums, downzoning, planning documents that just have a conditional use permit, that also may significantly impact the cost, supply, or approval certainty of a housing development project. So, however, though, when we, in terms of downzoning, when we talk about that, there is some room to apply for a project if you have assembled a proposal that includes a combination of downzoning and upzoning that will have the net a net positive effect on accelerating housing production. So for example, what that means is maybe you're downzoning an area to make sure to, as a anti-displacement measure, and to make sure that you're preventing gentrification in a specific area, while you're also upzoning another neighborhood to allow for more housing to occur in that community. And maybe you're also downzoning for preservation reasons. So when you combine those two activities together, then ideally it should have a net effect on housing production in your community and that's generally going to be eligible. We do have examples of proposals that look like that. So again, if you are interested in combining downzoning and upzoning, maybe with some anti-displacement preservation measures, then we can definitely send you those examples so, you can, so it can help you um, develop an application. Next slide, please. So eligible uses include staffing consultants to implement the eligible activity. So if you have in-house staff that, let's say you're, okay, let's say you're applying for a housing element update and you have in-house staff that are gonna work on developing and preparing and adopting that housing element update. Those in-house staff members can be played through the LEAP funding grant program. Or you have, again, you're applying for a housing element update, you're gonna hire a consultant to update the housing element. Again, they can also be paid through the LEAP grant program. Cost any cost associated with preparing and adopting the eligible activity. Um, so sometimes I always like to emphasize people don't catch when we say costs associated with preparing and adopting the eligible activity. That also includes public engagement and public participation. So you let's say, let's go back to the housing element update example. You know, there's a public participation and engagement section within your housing element update. That can be funded through the LEAP grant program, again, as long as it's part of the larger proposal. And also, if there's any campaigning you might need to do or marketing to adopt a specific planning document, so you can add those public engagement um, or community participation costs as part of your LEAP activity. Um, subcontracting to implement the eligible activity, that's totally fine. Subcontracting with consultants or um, whoever might be implementing your approved activity, and 5% of the maximum grant amount can be used on admin costs. So project management is usually what we consider as, sorry, not project management. Um, admin costs are usually considered as invoicing, billing, maybe the annual, completing the annual uh, report or the closeout report. Those are things, uh, sometimes the uh, printing costs, we consider as admin costs. Project management, so that's kind of staff working with consultants, consultants working with the staff, adopting, keeping up with timelines, that usually falls into project management, which is 
um, which can be used for, for the total LEAP grant amount, but the 5% can only be used, maximum can be used for admin costs. Again, that's like filling out your invoices, doing your closeout reports, doing some printing, that sort of thing. Next slide, please. So key dates. So the NOFA was released um, this year in January. That means the application has been out for a year total, but that's okay. No rush, we'll get you through the doors. Um, the NOFA workshops, we're doing them, we've been doing them ongoing since we released the NOFA. Regional technical assistance workshops like this, we've been doing that ongoing since we released the NOFA. Over the counter period, so basically your deadline to apply is January 31st, 2021. Um, you could wait till the, the, till the deadline, but we recommend and we highly encourage you to apply as soon as possible. And your final due date again is January 31st, 2021. You see that it's been um, strike lined in red. So the July 1st, 2020 was the original due date. We did get a, an extension from the legislature to line this program up with the REAP funding program, um, especially for applicants who are interested in aligning or layering their REAP, SB2, and LEAP projects together. So again, biggest point I wanna make of this presentation, your due date is January 31st, 2021. Don't miss it. If you're having trouble, you're worried about making this deadline, just contact us. We will figure out a way to get you into the deadline before um, the due date passes. Our technical assistance program, which I will go over, which I want to also say Michael Sagala and um, Robert Phipps from Fresno Cog is part of this technical assistance program is running until December 2023. I'll go over that in a little bit in the next slides. And your expenditure deadline, another very important deadline you want to keep up, keep track of, is December 31st, 2023. So what that means is you have till December 31st, 2023 to spend all your funds on your eligible activities. Now I want to put a caveat there really quick is the department does um, require you and also it, it's required within your timeline, your project timeline in your application, that your last invoice comes to the department, comes to HCD by September 2023. The reason for the gap between September and December is so the department has enough time to process your invoices and get you your money before that expenditure deadline hits. So you want to start planning that your projects are complete by um, and and the all the money is spent by September 2023. It's okay if you're you know you know you've spent all your money and your adoption may happen in October November, but you want to make sure that last invoice is coming to us by September 2023, so we don't end up having a delay in invoicing and we can't get your money on time. Next slide, please. Okay, so now I've done an overview of the program, all the things you wanna know. I'm gonna go over the process when you apply for the program. So once you've completed, once you've submitted a completed application, we'll have the, and once the department has received your application, we aim to complete preliminary reviews within 30 days. What that means is we'll take a look at the application, we'll contact you to make sure, to let you know we have received your application, You'll have an assigned reviewer for your region. I'll go over your assigned reviewers um, in the next couple slides. And we'll let you know if there's anything else we may need to continue processing and reviewing your application. Once we've gotten your application to a point where it can be approved and it's received a staff and management approval, we'll target to issue an award letter within 60 days of receiving your application. Again, these are target dates. We are trying our best to stick by them. It depends on the volume of how many applications we've received, but roughly we will try to target issue um, award your it, target to issue your award letters within 60 days of receiving the application. And then subsequently, we'll start working on your standard agreement, which is your contract, within 60 days of issuing your award letter. I do want to say in the pro, in the in the midst of all these steps that you see here, you are allowed to start incurring cost on your eligible activities while we are processing your application and working on your standard agreement and your award letters. Technically, you are actually allowed to start incurring costs on these projects that you might have identified since the release of the NOFA. So that's January 27th, 2020. So you can continue your projects, you can work on them while we're trying to process your application. If you're a little unsure, if your project might be eligible, so you don't want to incur costs, worried that we may not approve it, 
you can always run it by us first and we can let you know if this is a project that is definitely fits and aligns with the LEAP program or we may need to make some adjustments. Next slide, please. So if there's anything I wanna emphasize, due date is January 31st, 2020, 2021. We don't wanna miss that. And please contact us if you're having any issues trying to get your application in between in, um, by that deadline. You can find the application on our LEAP funding webpage under grants and funding at hcd.ca.gov. Next slide, please. So to go over the main components as part of your application. So the first thing you have is your project description. This is a narrative description where you describe generally each activity, the tasks or subtasks associated with each activity, and plans for adopting and implementing the pro proposed activity. I do want to flag really quickly too, we're happy to send you what a LEAP application looks like, examples from other cities, best practices, um, so you know that you're exactly kind of on the right track. Second, you're going to have a project timeline and budget that's going to include your deliverables, your subtasks, and a task, a specifically a task for adopting that proposed project or implementing that proposed project. Again, in this project timeline, you also want to make sure that your projects are aiming to be completed or that last invoice is aiming to get to HCD by September 2023. And you want to make sure the dates reflect that. Attachment two is going to be your nexus, which quantifies the nexus to production. I'll kind of go over that in the next slide. Again, if you're familiar with the SB2 planning grants program, it's very similar. Attachment three is where you'll demonstrate consistency with state and other planning priorities. Um, and uh, lastly, you'll also need a signed and completed resolution. This is going to be really important. So I will want to say here is that one, if you haven't worked on your resolution yet or taken it to city council for adoption, I would re recommend that the first thing you do after this webinar, we have a required template please follow that template and use that. Fill in your city name and have it ready to go to get adopted because you do need that as part of submitting your application. So this way, while you're working on you know, what activities you might wanna do, maybe working with HCD on your draft application, your resolution is ready to go. And lastly, you'll need to include a taxpayer ID form so we can pay you. Next slide, please. So let's talk about the nexus to accelerating housing production. That is attachment two of the application. So as part of the application and to again, accomplish the goals of this program, an applicant needs to demonstrate how their proposed activity has a nexus or has a direct connection to accelerating housing production. So to do that, you can use the project description to explain that nexus and then you'll fill out attachment two to quantify that nexus. So it's important to note that demonstrating a nexus and quantifying outcomes is required for each of the proposed activities. So let's say you are proposing to have three eligible projects. You're doing a housing element update, maybe you're doing some rezoning and you're purchasing some permit software program. For each of those three activities I just laid out, you wanna make sure you have outcomes or a nexus for each of them separately. Next slide, please. So a quick tip, I guess, on how you can fill out the nexus to accelerating housing production. Again, that's attachment two. So the way to complete attachment two and demonstrate that nexus, I kind of laid out some questions that you can consider while you're brainstorming your eligible activities. So what will be the anticipated outcome of your proposed project? For example, will it reduce processing time? So if you're purchasing a software um, or you're doing software upgrades for your permit software and uh, permit system, will it reduce the time it takes to process a permit? That right there is your nexus for that project, is the time it takes to reduce time um, that's going to be reduced uh, when purchase, processing a permit. Will it reduce development costs imposed on a city or the developer? Will it increase approval certainty by reducing the discretionary review? Will it increase how many entitlements can get processed? Will it increase the feasibility of development projects? Will zoning increase the number of units that can be permitted in that area? Those are all questions you can ask yourself based on the projects you're thinking about. And then those numbers 
Again, they only have to be estimates, can then be plugged into that attachment too, to quantify that, the outcome of that project. So like I, I recommend brainstorming through these questions, seeing how your proposed project will answer one or a few of these questions. Um, again, like I said, the nexus, the quantification just has to be an estimate. Do the best you can. Um, I wouldn't stress over it too much, but just think about, again, let's go back to the permit software um, example. You know, if right now it's taking you six months, let's say, to pro uh, process a permit and purchasing the software will now take you three months. Right there, you have a reduction in timing by three months and that's your nexus. That's kind of how you want to look at it. Or, you know, you're upzoning in a particular area and you're increasing density. Right now, it only allows for, let's say, 100 units. It's going to allow now for 200 units once you're completed with the zoning, the upzoning. Right there, you have your nexus for that project. Next slide, please. So attachment three, that's your state and other planning priorities. It basically means that um, applica applicants should demonstrate how they've been consistent with state or any other planning priorities. So you can do this in two ways. One, you can either show us how your proposed activity in your application will be consistent with state or other planning priorities, or if you have a list of activities that you've completed in the last five years, you can use any activities you've completed in the last five years that are that are consistent with state or other planning priorities. So the applicant should fill out all areas that apply to your jurisdiction. This is really an ex a way to toot your horn, saying that, hey, look, state of California, look at all these things I've done. I've been consistent with all of your priorities. As a jurisdiction, we're working on A, B, and C. So anywhere where you kind of see that I'm, you know, as a city, we're working on this, or we've completed it, or our projects are going to be consistent with this, definitely fill that out to make sure to kind of, again, like I said, toot your own horn. Next slide, please. Resolution. So if there's two things I want you to take away from this presentation, one, it's the deadline, and second, it's the resolution. So there is a required template that you need to use. It's important that you use the required template because all of the resolutions go through an internal legal review with our department and they have to get approved. If they don't get approved, it's very like, it's possible, it's likely that we have to send the res resolution back to you and you may have to go back to council and readopt it. And that can take a lot of time. We don't wanna do that. We don't wanna end up having you redo a resolution and delay your application process. So just follow the required template. If you do have to make changes, Again, like I said, it is a required template, but if there are super minor changes that you need to make or would like to make, please contact us before you do any of that so we can let you know if you're on the right track or you're kind of falling off the wagon a little bit. Next slide, please. So reporting. We get a lot of questions about this program. Sounds great. Hopefully I've made it seem like it's easy to apply for. I know I've talked a lot, but we get a lot of questions about it. Seems great, seems easy to apply for, but what are the reporting requirements? So there's two reporting requirements. One is an annual report, one is a closeout report. So the reporting, the annual reporting requirement was defined by statute and requires the jurisdiction to submit a report to the department annually until the funds have been fully expended. So the annual report should include a status of the proposed uses that were approved, impact on housing within the region or jurisdiction, and a summary of building permits, certificates of occupancy, or other completed entitlements that were issued by the jurisdiction. This may sound like your housing element annual progress report. It is similar, and we are looking at ways to kind of combine the two reports so you're not duplicating and sending us two separate reports. So in addition to your annual report, once the awardee has completed the deliverables in their standard agreement, so basically once you've completed your project, you're gonna to wanna to submit a closeout report. The closeout report, the copy of it can be found in the NOFA, and the closeout report generally should include a brief summary of the project, lead agencies and partnerships that were involved in your project, any drivers in the engagement process, any challenges you've uh, found within the process, um, outcomes, and replicability. I'm gonna stop here. Melissa, it says that there's connection issues. Can you hear me okay? I can. Um, is anybody on the phone? If you're having trouble hearing, um, feel free to drop a, a question to us in the chat box or in the questions box. Um, but I'm not hearing any challenges. Okay, sounds good. 
So one of the goals of the closeout report is we're just trying to, at the department, we're just trying to collect best practices and showcase your completed projects at a statewide level and also let neighboring jurisdictions and regions kind of know what you guys have done and if they want to learn anything from it. And we're also curious to see if you ran into any challenges and how HCD could have helped. Next slide, please. So that is the final closeout report. It, again, like I said, you can find it in the NOFA. Next slide, please. And like I said, don't forget to apply by January 31st, 2021. Next slide, please. So key differences between the LEAP and SB2 program. Hope, um, again, if you're familiar with the SB2 program, hopefully you're kind of starting to see a lot of the similarities. So there's a couple points I wanna call out that are different. So one is the grant amounts. With the SB2 program, we had three categories for grant amounts, small, medium, and large jurisdiction. For this program, statute explicitly defined six different categories and maximum grant amounts. For eligibility, which is the second thing, as you might have remembered to access the SB2 planning grants program, you needed to have an APR and a housing element that was found in compliance. For this program, you don't need it. All you need is an eligible project that demonstrates a nexus to production and a resolution. Um, but to be eligible for this program, that's all you need, just an eligible project that, in your opinion, will lead to, lead to having a nexus to housing production. Lastly, re reporting requirements. So for the SB2 program, we have it that you only report once, and that's your closeout report when your gr grant funds are fully expended. Uh, for the LEAP funding program, the statute states that applicants will submit a report annually in addition to your closeout report. Next slide, please. So as Robert and Michael did mention earlier, you can layer these funding sources. Um, so a ways to do that is one example is if you have an existing SB2 project and you really kind of want to take it to the next level, then you would you can use the LEAP funding to take your SB2 existing project to that next level, let's say. Or let's say you have an SB2 planning grants project, an existing project, and you kind of need some more funding to supplement that existing project. You can use your LEAP funding to also do that. Lastly, um, you know, again, this is up to the COGS and the regional entity, but there is room or there is an opportunity where you could le um, layer your LEAP funding and your REAP suballocation, as well as your SB2 planning grant. Next slide, please. Okay, so now I'm gonna go over technical assistance. One, our partnership with Fresno Cog and Michael Sagala, as well as the LEAP technical assistance that we have available. Next slide, please. So very importantly, this is the contact info for getting direct LEAP technical assistance. If you have any questions about how to apply, general questions, you have an idea, you're not sure if it's eligible, you have a draft application, maybe you filled it out halfway through, you wanna get feedback to know if you're on the right track, anything possible, please contact us at the department through these LEAP regional liaisons, that includes me as well, to get that direct assistance. We're here for you. We have a program dedicated to jurisdictions to get them to apply and be comfortable applying for the LEAP program. So for Fresno, Madeira, and Stanislaus County, that's going to be Dulce and Paul McDougall. They're both on the line. For the San Joaquin County, that will be me. You can directly contact me. Um, and for the Kings, Kern, Merced, and Tulare counties, that will be Gianna, who you can contact. Next slide, please. So also to go over our long-term TA program. So with the SB2 planning grants, we had phase one of our technical assistance program. Phase one meant that we were providing direct assistance to the SB2 applicants to get them to apply, very similar to the LEAP program. Now we're actually at the department and with PlaceWorks, we're um, moving into phase two of this technical assistance program. Next slide, please. So phase two of this technical assistance program is gonna include toolkits, resources, and things that are regionally tailored to each region across the state. Toolkits that are gonna to be developed on a statewide level 
include a housing portal, model ordinances that jurisdictions can take off the shelf and use, a CEQA site check tool that's in a beta form right now through with OPR, an objective standards how-to guide, and tools and resources around ADUs. Next slide, please. And again, like I said, these are tools that are gonna be available on a statewide level. Now I kinda wanna go into our regional technical assistance program. This is gonna be most relevant for all of you here today because we are developing a San Joaquin regional technical assistance program in collaboration with Robert and Michael to kind of get you guys the long-term help you might need to accelerating housing production. And really the question is, how can HCD help the San Joaquin Valley region in their housing planning needs? Next slide, please. So the way we're gonna find that out is currently right now, hopefully you've seen it. If not, there is a TA plan survey. There's, so basically it's a survey that we are asking all jurisdictions to fill out and tell us what are their housing planning needs, what are their challenges, and what kind of toolkits, tools, resources can HCD develop to help address those needs. All that survey results and feedback will go into a regional TA plan for the San Joaquin Valley. This is gonna be a plan that's gonna um, apply from now until 2023. That's gonna include a set of tools, resources, workshops, webinars, you name it within this plan that HCD, PlaceWorks, and even um, Fresno Cog and Michael Scala and all of us will work on to, to uh, deliver to the region. And then lastly, once we've developed that regional TA plan and we've gotten buy off from all of you, we're gonna be implementing those tools and resources that you've asked for. Next slide, please. So, that's pretty much the end of my presentation. Um, for more information on the technical assistance for LEAP or even the TA that I just talked about, the regionally tailored TA, you can directly contact our team at earlyactionplanning at hcd.ca.gov. There we can even put you in contact with your direct, direct LEAP TA um, regional liaisons in case you didn't get the contact info, although I do know that um, they will be sending out this presentation after this webinar is over. And then if you have questions about the pro housing program that I mentioned, you can contact the team at prohousingpolicies at hcd.ca.gov. And now we will just open it up for Q&A. Carly, do you wanna facilitate the Q&A session? We actually do not have any questions in wow. the question box. Either I made everyone fall asleep, which is possible, or I was just very thorough. <laughs> Just a quick reminder about logistics. Um, if you do have a question, please feel free to drop that into the questions box um, that you should see in your control panel. Um, we can get this in a few minutes just to see if we get any additional questions um, in case we missed you at the beginning. And then as Sohab just mentioned, we will be distributing the full slide deck as well as the recording of this presentation to you all and to everybody who registered for the webinar. Um, you can definitely refer back to it there, get the contact information for your regional liaison, um, anything like that that you might need as follow-up as well. We do have one. It says, um, waiting for a contract. Can we expect the contract? And it has been delayed due to the extension of the deadline in January. Sure. So so the con Oh yeah, go ahead. No, go ahead. Okay, I was gonna say, if this, if we're talking about the LEAP contract, that possibly means an app, a jurisdiction who's already applied. We did, re we did originally have delays in our standard agreements, our contracts for LEAP, because of they were pushing out the SB2 planning grant contracts, as well as the home key contracts, but they have picked up the speed on that. And I think you can just contact us directly and we can give you a more accurate time frame of when those contracts were, will be ready. But no award letters or contracts are being delayed given the deadline extension. They, I think they were only delayed because of capacity issues. Or another way to put that, when the uh, leg our legislature and our governor extended the uh, deadline um, from July 1st to um, January 31st, the expenditure deadline was also extended to December 31st of 2023. So I'm, not much, I'm not sure which question they're asking, but, um, but yeah, on, on the, the contracts, we're getting them out much faster. Uh, we, we, so we prioritize resources uh, to, to move those things. 
Great, and I have one more question. It says that the SB2 funded activities likely started before January 2020, but LEAP funds can still be layered. Can you kind of explain that layering process a little bit more? Sure, I will actually let Paul explain that a little bit more since he um, had some applications that did that. Paul? Um, it, it really depends on the situation. Uh, sometimes uh, we will see some SB2 planning grants where they were looking for the SB2 to, to uh, fund some of a maybe a long term planning document or a part of a planning document. And uh, um, like maybe development of a specific plan, but you couldn't quite afford the CEQA. Are you doing a portion of the general plan and not the whole general plan? Those types of things where, um, you know, you get the leap and it's like, okay, now I can finish up the project. Um, so, I mean, there's there's situations where you're existing, where you're, where the leap can complement your existing SB2. Um, but another thing that can happen here is that we've left the door wide open to rescope. And, uh, um, and, and so, We've seen some folks that, that have, um, you know, they start on their SB2 planning grant and they just realize like, we still want to do project one, but um, we want to um, kind of uh, switch out uh, two for a new one. And then it's like, okay, well, you can rescope and you can also rescope to adjust and then uh, complement your leap and reap. So if you want to um, kind of go back and say, well, I don't want to do that project, I want to do this one. Um, as part of a package and then then coordinate that with your leap and your reap and um, that's totally doable and we're going to leave that same kind of rescoping authority um in our leap contracts you know so if you get down the road a little bit and things change and you want to focus on something else um or you want to shift some costs here and there or kind of rework your description a little bit those are all the kinds of things that we've left the flexibility uh, um, to do Thanks, Paul. That's all the questions we have in the box at this time. Should we just kick around for six minutes just in case someone has a neat idea pop into their head? <laughs> I don't know if we want to do that, but I do want to say um, just to all the local governments out there that we always get questions at the Institute for Local Government looking for money for climate action planning or specific transportation or housing um, types of plans. So even if this seems, if you're a smaller city and it seems like you have the $65,000 allocation, really think about how you can layer that with other funding opportunities or make an investment, even though I know it's really hard out of the general fund right now. Um, you just don't want to leave this money on the table. It just does not come around. And so I know that we had it at SB2 and now we have it at LEAP and there's some opportunities through the REAP program. I just encourage all of you to really take advantage of this opportunity. Yeah, we've had some great projects where we've, they've layered it with the, the Caltrans SB1 planning grants and sustainability planning grants. Um, I think like Oceanside and what, uh, what was the other one? So how was it Rialto or? No, it was oh man, it was up north. Oh man. Yeah. No. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, it, it was. They, uh, they cleared, um, you know, there's other and... planning resources out there. There's planning resources uh, with the Department of Conservation even. Um where where you know if to the extent that folks want to be thinking about like more integrated planning, meaning when we're thinking about our housing, we're thinking about um, other land uses, whether it be uh, environmental justice, whether it be our conservation or safety elements, you know, we're, we're leaving that wide open to, to think creatively. Great, we do have one more. Um, Elizabeth Hahn is asking if we can show the slide um, that came after the layering table. It's the site about tools and resources. Could we flip back sure. to that really quick? One more, that one. Was I think it's that one. Uh, Melissa, if you could go one more over, forward. That one, yeah. Perfect. And then I just have one more question um, that someone's having a hard time kind of locating the. Um, the resolution template alone. I know it's part of the 14 page application. Is there a way that it's pulled out by itself anywhere? I do have it pulled out on my computer that I can send. Um, 
if you want to drop your email or Carly, maybe you can share an email and I can send it right over. Perfect. We can also include that in the follow-up email if that would be okay. helpful. If, if more than one um, attendee is looking for that, perhaps we can definitely include that as an attachment or a link in the um, follow-up email as well. Perfect. Let's go ahead and do that. I know I've had that request more than once. Same here. Yeah. It would be great um, if there's a way that we could just sort of get a sense from the group or folks planning on applying. Is this on the radar for the next couple of months? Uh, um, when do they plan on applying? If so, um, is there a way to, to ask, ask that? I think you just did. Do <laughs> people raise hands? Is that an option here or are there any other kind of things, tools? On? Um, they can raise their hand or they can just uh, put a note either in the chat box or in the questions box and we can capture all of that um, in the reports that we pull from the from the back end. So um, however you'd like to indicate that you um, are intending to to apply, please do. I'm seeing a couple of hands raised. Good, that's good. And, uh, um, you know, we've heard from some folks a little bit up north, uh, but some rural areas where we have this unprecedented planning money, and now, you know, basically it's, it's non competitive. You know, planning money sits here and waits for you, and then folks are all, that's great, but I don't think I can do the admin on that. I don't have the capacity to do that. And um, I'll just two things on that point, if that is your concern. Um, one is, is, as much as so obvious, kind of laid out the reporting requirements and the closeout requirements. That stuff is tremendously light, and if you're going to have an issue with that, we're we're, we're going to help you. Uh, so please don't don't shy away because of pretty minimal reporting requirements. The other kind of thing where admins come up is basically your invoicing. We have a fairly simple simplified invoicing process. It is not time consuming. Again, another area where we can provide TA. Um, so, you know, to the extent that you're worried about the admin and having the capacity to do that, um, we're open to problem solving with you. And we are, are, are actively thinking about ways we can kind of partner um, with external uh, um, groups to maybe help with that as well. So stay tuned there, but don't shy away from the program and don't leave the money on the table. Great, and we do have some people who have uh, been letting us know that they will be applying, so we will share that list with HCD, um, and glad to hear that they hopefully sparked some some renewed interest in the program. Cool. Great, uh, sounds good. Well, uh, oh, Paul, go ahead if you have any closing remarks. No, no closing No, you, you, you summed it up perfect. I, I was going to just stick around just for fun, you know, I had some <laughs> free time all day, you know, I just feel like, oh. I would just, I want to remind applicants, again, any issue you run into with applying, any questions you have, just email us. We're happy to help you work through it, problem solve anything. And also, if you're looking for uh, examples, project ideas, um, any type of sample applications, we're happy to share that as well. If you have a specific idea, you can always email and say, hey, Sohab, I'm looking for um, an application for a housing element update to see how that looks like. We're happy to share those examples. And don't forget to apply by January 31st, 2021. One more just in case, well done. <laughs> okay, well, perfect. Thank you so much, um, Sohab. Uh, we, again, will be distributing all of this information um, via email uh, in the next few days, so keep an eye out for that. And don't hesitate to reach out to anybody on the line here on the team if you have any questions or um, follow-up comments. Um, but with that, I will go ahead and close everything out unless you have any final, final, final words, Sohab. No, thank other than thank you. Thank you all for being here. All right. Well, thank you. Everybody have a great afternoon. All right.